So this morning, our scripture is actually from Hebrews 7, which is part of the lectionary uh, readings, and it is right in the middle of the book of Hebrews, so it can be a little confusing, but uh, we'll kind of try to work our way through it a bit and try to pull it apart and hopefully make it not quite so confusing. So Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 28. Now, there have been many of those priests. You can tell there was lots before this, right? Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Let's pray one more time. Lord Jesus, as we open Scripture, your word, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart as I speak be pleasing to you. And may all of our hearts and minds be open to what you would have us hear from you this morning. So that your work of transformation in our hearts and in our lives will continue. And that we will be able to step out and live for you in all things. Pray this in your name. Amen. So the passage this morning is rather short, and it's right in the middle of the book of Hebrews, and kind of pulled out of context in so many ways. But what what really resonated for me this week is really the permanency of Jesus, the high priest who saves completely and lives forever, forever to intercede with us, with God the Father. He speaks on our behalf. He advocates for us. In other words, Jesus has our back, if you will. When the chips are down, we can count on Jesus. And that that idea of uh, Jesus having our back is just a short phrase that I'm hoping that as we go through this and so on, that as you go about your week this week, that will resonate in your mind and bring back to you some of the things that I'll be speaking about this morning. But to get a better grasp of the significance of what this means, for our, like, in general, but for our daily lives, what we'll do is we'll dig into the passage a little bit more. As I said, this is right from the middle of the book of Hebrews. And the passage is is really far removed from our own cultural reality. And so in many ways, it's rather hard to grasp what it's really being said here. We understand the words to a certain extent, but we don't really fully grasp the depth of the meaning of it. So first, what's the context? So Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, was written to Christians, to believers of Jesus, who were experiencing persecution. They were experiencing hardship because of their faith. And they they just were at a point where they were thinking, is it really worth it? Can I really count on Jesus? And they were basically ready to give up on faith in Christ. And these same believers were very familiar with what's called the Torah. And that's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. They were really, really familiar with the Torah. So they were very likely Jewish people 
who had come to believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah that had been promised by the prophets and their ancestors long ago. And so the author of Hebrews, and we don't know who the author is, he is writing to reassure the believers that Jesus Christ can be trusted. Jesus is a true solid foundation on which to live our lives. Jesus has their back and he has our back. And so our passage begins with these words. Now there have been many of those priests. So uh, to understand what we need to understand, have a little bit of a comprehension of the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament, to have a little bit of an idea of what he's talking about here. That's a, that's a lot to explain in 15 minutes. Actually, less than 15 minutes. More like five. But I'll give it a go. So... First of all, why is this sacrificial system that included priests even necessary? So Adam and Eve, in the beginning of scripture, we hear about Adam and Eve, who were created in God's image. And they had a relationship with God the Father that was good and whole. They they were able to connect with God the Father without any break or interruption. However, they turned away from God. We often talk about it as rebellion from God, wanting to go their own way. And so when that happened, all of humanity essentially fell into sin. And we talk about this a lot as Christians. We kind of have this way of talking about it. But really what happened was that the relationship between humanity and God was broken. Because... Humanity became imperfect. And we all know this. We commonly talk about humanity as being uh, that to be human is to be imperfect. Nobody's perfect. And that's part of the identity of who we are as human beings these days. But the very definition or essence of God is that he is perfect, holy, set apart. And so to have a relationship between a holy, perfect God and imperfect humanity doesn't work. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. The two no longer connect. The two no longer match. But God loves and loved humanity and his creation too much to give up. You could say he had the the back of humanity in a sense, even though... Humanity didn't deserve it. And so he called the people, the people of the Israelites, and created the sacrificial system. And it was this system that allowed for a relationship with God despite people's sins. So if you could just put up that one slide I have, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a picture. So on the left side here, you, have, you see what was called the tabernacle. It's called the tent of meeting. And uh, in the front there, that is where the priests would sacrifice. And they would sacrifice animals, which is completely beyond what we understand. I mean, we know about it, but it really isn't part of the way we live, our understanding of how to connect with God or anything. We don't really fully comprehend all of that. But they offered sacrifices to God um, as a way of uh, acknowledging the sins and um, offering it um, in a sense to pay for the sins or to wipe away the sins so the people could come to God. And the priests were the ones that did this. And the priests were uh, from the tribe of Levi. The Israelites, right, were made up of 12 tribes, and one of those tribes was the tribe of Levi. And so the priests were from the uh, tribe of Levi, and they were the mediators, the intercessors, the people who interceded between God and all the people. And the tent of meeting was the place on earth where God was said to dwell. And this tent of meeting in the back is where the actual tent of meeting on. And on the right-hand side, you will see the inside of that part which is actually the full the tabernacle part the tent part and only the priests could go in there 
And in the very back, behind that uh, curtain, that's what was called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and only once a year, after sacrificing for his sins and being purified from his, for his sins and for the sins of the people. And then he would go to the very back. And it was through that system that God related to the people and the people were, re- were able to relate to God. And that was the system that they had. You can uh, turn the slide off. It's, it's a bit hard for us to wrap our heads around, actually, this concept of the sacrificial system. Many of us are familiar with it because we have been Christians for a long time, and so we've studied our scripture, we've studied the Bible, and uh, so we know it. But to really the depth of what this meant for the people, we don't really fully get. But we, the, the part about intercession and mediation, we have a little bit better understanding and concept of this idea of a go-between between between two parties for the purpose of communicating and healing a relationship. That was the point of it, right? And we do understand this concept a bit better than the idea of sacrificing animals. Although in our tradition, we don't really think about it in terms so much of our relationship with God, this idea of a mediator. In the Catholic tradition, they still have priests that and often that's kind of still seen that way and even in the Anglican tradition there's a little bit more of that this idea of of someone mediating between God and people in our tradition we focus on the fact that we don't really need a human intercessor anymore we are able to go straight to God because Jesus is our intercessor and that's what we're talking about this morning essentially that's what Hebrews is saying right However, we do pray for each other, and that's a type of informal intercession. And interceding is definitely part of our culture in different ways, and there's different kinds. Sometimes there's informal kinds of things that we do, like we intercede or advocate for our children with teachers and doctors in different ways, different things like that. Um, There are those who advocate for, um, on behalf of those who are marginalized, who have no power in our society, right? Right? making sure that um, these people receive what they need to thrive. So we think of it in terms of seeking justice, right? Often the mediating, interceding, is specifically to restore broken relationships. So we have very formal ones, right? Like peace negotiations between countries that is brokered by a third party. Or mediation between two groups or two people where a relationship has been broken and direct communication can't be, is no longer effective. And it's this kind of mediating, interceding, that the priests of the Old Testament, that's what they did with this sacrificial system. The idea was that because of this, that broken relationship between God and humanity, that there could still be communication, that people could still know what God, how God wanted them to live, still know that God loved them, and that God could communicate with the people about how to live in the way of God. But this system and the priests, which were part of it, were never able to restore the people into relationship with God permanently, right? The sacrifices were symbolic, and so they had to continually be be offered all the time. And the priests were both imperfect themselves and they were mortal, right? So they died and another had to take their place. So it didn't actually fix the broken relationship between humanity and God entirely. But our passage from Hebrews this morning is saying that Jesus is the permanent high priest. He saves completely and meets our every need and he always lives to intercede for us. He has our backs. And we can absolutely count on Jesus. So why is this the case? Well, he lives forever and his sacrifice is not symbolic. He offered himself once for all for the sins of the people. 
And he's able to do this because he is holy, blameless, poor, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted about the, above the heavens. So what does this mean? What is this saying? Saying that Jesus was and isn't merely only a human being. Jesus is God incarnate. God made human. The book of Hebrews begins with these words. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his son, his son Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom all he made and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And the gospel of John begins with these words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. No one comes to the Father but through me. They're talking about Jesus here. You can uh, put up the slide one more time. So when Jesus died on the cross, and most of us here are familiar with that, Jesus died on the cross... The curtain between, by the Holy of Holies in the back there, was torn from top to bottom. For us, this is mostly just information knowledge. But for the people who lived this sacrificial system, it was a completely life-changing, completely changed everything about the way they saw what it meant and to live for God and what it meant to be in relationship for God. It was completely life-altering. You can turn it off, that's fine. And in Hebrews 6, so I'm just picking through the book of Hebrews a little bit here. Hebrews 6, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Think about that. The fact that Jesus tore that curtain from the top to the bottom so that there is now no longer any barrier between humanity and God. He has healed that relationship. This hope is an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters that inner sanctuary behind the curtain, right? Where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And we could do a whole sermon on Melchizedek, but Hebrews actually gives a really nice, uh, short explanation of who Melchizedek is. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, and priest of God Most High, he met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. The name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. So Jesus, they're saying, Jesus, king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Jesus, king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, Without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. All this boils down to is that we can absolutely, completely, entirely count on Jesus. Count on Jesus to intercede for us. Jesus has our backs. Count on him to forgive our sins, remove our guilt and shame, and intercede for us with God the Father. To intercede for us so that we're able to live as people of God's shalom, peace, abundance, hope, and reflect the love of Jesus to others in this world. 
in this world that is so full still of brokenness, pain, and violence. It's a pretty general statement. So how specifically, practically, might this look like for Jesus to intercede for us with God the Father in our everyday lives? Does it mean that he will answer our prayers in the way we'd, we, we would like? So that when we pray that Jesus intercedes in the sense that he says our prayers and, he, and, he, and he's like, yes, this is, this is what I desire for you. We can come to God in prayer and pray about anything. And there are times when Jesus answers our prayers the way we want. But there are also times when our prayers are not answered in the way that we hope they would be answered. When Jesus intercedes for us, what he's interceding for is so that our relationship with him can be whole and healthy. It's not to spare us from hardship or grief or pain or confusion. Because the fact is, is that there are millions of faithful believers who live in the midst of very trying circumstances all around the world. And these circumstances don't change for years, sometimes even for a lifetime. Sometimes there's generations of difficult circumstances. Believers suffer, they suffer persecution, and they also suffer from all the other things that everybody suffers from, wars and famine, plague, injustice. Just a few of the groups of people that we know suffer, um, it, people from Syria, Haiti today, indigenous people for years and years, generations, right? And the original audience of the book of Hebrews was struggling as well. And they were asking the question, is faith in Jesus really worth it? Does Jesus really make a difference in their daily lives? And the author is declaring, yes, absolutely Jesus is the one we can count on to intercede for us. But if this doesn't mean that God will make our lives easy, what does it mean? You know, it's not so much about the specifics of our circumstances, but rather about what kind of people we are within those circumstances. Last week, Pastor Aaron spoke about the and. There's so much that is difficult, messy in the world and and in our lives. And Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, living forever, interceding for us, for all believers, for humanity. To keep us in relationship with God, which means that we can acknowledge that life is uncertain, insecure, and be confident God is sovereign and his kingdom will come fully and completely one day. We can recognize our fears and have courage to keep going through the perfect love of Jesus that drives out all fear. Struggle with despair and at the same time have hope for the future. We grieve death and suffering and live with joy in Jesus. We can face, admit our shame and our guilt and experience wholeness in Christ. Be aware of war and violence, and trust that peace will come. We can struggle with our resentments and our biases and our bitterness, and still love all people, including our enemies and those who disagree with us. We're able to admit our anxieties, our worry, our agitation, and experience incredible Sabbath peace and rest. Jesus lives forever to intercede for us with God the Father to bring us and keep us in relationship with him so that we can be confident that our weaknesses, our struggles, our brokenness will be overcome and we will be people known by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control in each area of our lives. Be these kind of people in our work lives, in our church lives, in our... You went to a movie yesterday. In our entertainment. (laughs) In our lives with our families our lives with our friends, our lives with the strangers, to be people who are known by the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus intercedes for us and helps us be those kind of people. It's possible that you're thinking, how am I supposed to do this? That at the moment you feel yourself mired in and focused on the mess and the brokenness around us and unable to experience in any way the the, uh, love of Christ and unable to have a sense of living the fruit of the Spirit. You know, I think about the picture that came to mind when I was thinking about this both and... It's a bit of a teeter-totter in this world that is we living in this tension, right? There are times when we are more aware of the brokenness than the peace and love and hope uh, that the life in Jesus gives us. At those times, Jesus intercedes for us, sometimes directly, but often through others. I have a friend whose grief when she lost her daughter was so great that she wasn't able to pray anymore. She had always found the Lord's Prayer really comforting, but she couldn't remember it. So one day she phoned me and she asked me to pray for her and to pray it with her. She was mired in the grief and the brokenness. Jesus interceded for her through me and in many different ways to lift her up to know that he is with her uh, Leah just a few weeks ago said was ready, that she was ready to give up on faith in Jesus but a comment from Pastor Aaron in his sermon and I don't remember the comment actually <laughs> made her realize and remember that Jesus is holding on to her Jesus has her back if you will I don't know exactly where you're at this morning in this teeter-totter kind of a both and, but Jesus does and we can absolutely count on him to have our backs, to intercede for us so that by the power of the Spirit, we are able to be in relationship with God and to live as people of God, people who live day by day, moment by moment, reflecting the love of Jesus and exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. So the question for us this morning, for each of us, is do you, do I, do we believe that Jesus has our back? Do we believe it really makes a difference in our daily lives, in all our relationships with each other and our relationship to God? So I encourage you that as you go about your week and your daily routines, as you read and listen and watch what's happening around you, both close by and far away, I encourage you to ponder and pray about what it means for how you live your life that Jesus has your back. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are our intercessor with God the Father. That God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you, God, have our backs. You love us so much that you have done everything necessary so that we can be in relationship with you. You've healed that relationship. And that even though we are still in this world that is full of brokenness, it's a mess, full of pain and sorrow and evil, 
that you intercede for us so that our relationship with you can stay strong, so that we can be your people, people who reflect your love, your grace, your mercy to others, people who express the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. Lord, we pray that you continue to intercede for us directly and with different people, different means that you use so that we will continue to be transformed into people like you. Pray this in your name. Amen.